Welcome to the Known Victory Church YouTube channel. We are so glad that you found us today. We exist to make Jesus known and to be a place that anyone can call home. If you haven't yet, make sure to subscribe, like, and share these messages so we can truly make Jesus known in our homes, cities, and across the world. We pray that this message impacts you and helps you to grow closer to Jesus. I do want to welcome you uh, to church this morning, and I'm excited um, that you're with us today. And again, my name is Dustin. I'm the lead pastor here, and it's an honor uh, that, you're, that you're here uh, with us today. Um, and if you were to summarize, you know, your life, I mean, look at your life, like how would we look at... Um, kind of determining kind of what we're about. Like if you were to think about your life, you know, as businesses have or as, you know, churches have vision statements or mission statements, you ever had a moment where you've been like, okay, you know, what am I fully about? What do I want people to see when they see me? And at, at Known Victory Church, our church, we have a statement that we like to say um, because it's really what we're all about and it's about Jesus for people. Really, we're about Jesus. That's who we're about. There's, we're not denying that. That's who we're about. That's who we worship. That's who we serve. That's who we follow is Jesus. And the number two, we're four people. You know, we want to be for one another, not just for each other on a Sunday, but midweek where we can be making meals or be praying or be being generous and visiting each other. That, that, that as a church, it's not just about Sunday morning. And Sunday morning is such a small part of our week. It's, you know, maybe one to two hours of our week. Whereas the rest of our week, we should be connecting with one another and getting together. And this statement about Jesus for people, it's not like this is a brand new mind boggling statement, right? Like it's not like we got this, I'm like, man, the Lord has spoken something new to me, right? This is such a common thing if you see throughout scripture and throughout church about Jesus for people. In fact, this vision comes from this iconic story where Jesus is asked an important question, right? And this is the question that he's posed. It comes in Matthew chapter 22, verse 34 to 38. It says this, the most important commandment. Maybe you know this. But when the Pharisees heard that he silenced, that he had silenced the Sadducees. Now that's a hilarious statement in and of itself. That he silenced the Sadducees with his reply. They met together to question him again. One of them, an expert in religious law, tried to trap him with this question. Teacher, which is the most important commandment in the law of Moses? And Jesus replied, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. So there's this moment where people are trying to trap Jesus, the, the, the religious leaders, the, the experts are in the room and they're trying to question Jesus, trying to trip him up, trying to get something that they can you know, either get him arrested for or get him executed for. They're trying to trip him up with this question. And if you think about the, the law, the law, which wasn't just the Ten Commandments, uh, but rather it was over 600 different laws and commands that were, t that were taught and supposed to be followed throughout, if you read through the Old Testament, especially in the Torah. You read it, law after law, thing after thing they're supposed to do in order to have relationship or in order to be clean or to be pure in the eyes of God. All these laws, 600 laws. Now, a lot of that is, it's going to be tough to even remember 600 laws. So that's why the expert comes, like, I know the law inside and out. And he asks that question, which of the laws is the most important? This is a great question. And I think it's an important question. And of course, they were trying to trip him up here. But at the same time, I think it's an important question for us now is what is the most important for us to do if we're about Jesus, if we're about God, if he's what we're about, what is the most important thing for us to do to have right relationship with him? And that's it. You must love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. Now again, this statement Jesus says is not a brand new statement. Jesus wasn't the first one on the earth to say these words out loud. In fact, the Pharisees and those in the room would have had the Torah memorized, which is the first five books of the Old Testament. And so they would have had it memorized. Now if you read through that, some of us, we struggle just to read through it, let alone have it all memorized. Like I remember when I was maybe like 15 or 14, I decided one day that I wanted to read through the whole Bible. I'm not going to tell you how many times I fell asleep in the book of Numbers. I'm not joking. Like, and like, I wish I was joking, but I literally, I would try and read it at night too. 
And uh, I would fall asleep reading the book of Numbers, true story. They had this, this memorized. They, they knew this inside and out. So when Jesus said, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind, they wouldn't have been like, wow, that's new information. They would have been like, that's the answer they were looking for. If they're the teachers, right? They're like, yep, that's the right answer. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. That's what it's supposed to be. Again, they would have had it all memorized. In this verse, Jesus is really quoting from the book of Deuteronomy. And if you go to Deuteronomy chapter six, verse five, this is what it says. And you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength or with all your mind. It's not new information. It's not new information that, that was coming and Jesus spoke this and everyone's like, whoa, like it, it had existed for thousands of years already. This information already was there. And, and if you know kind of the story in Deuteronomy, we don't have a time to go through all of it, but, but something that's super interesting about Deuteronomy chapter six is that it comes after Deuteronomy chapter five. It's a fun fact about Deuteronomy six. Yeah, you're like, wow, I'm gonna share that information at work tomorrow, you know. Let me tell you something about Deuteronomy 5, 6. <laughs> but it comes after Deuteronomy 5. And Deuteronomy 5, verse 1, starts with this. It's the Ten Commandments for the covenant, for covenant community. That's how it starts. And chapter, uh, verse 1 says this. Moses called all the people of Israel together and said, Listen carefully, Israel. Hear the decrees and regulations I am giving you today so that you may learn them and obey them. So Moses goes through this whole kind of going through specifically the Ten Commandments and what to do and how it works and different situations that might come up and how to, how to live it out. In Deuteronomy chapter 5, he summarizes them and gives detail, explaining them and telling Israel really to obey and follow the commands of the Lord, right? Deuteronomy 5. And this is how Deuteronomy 5 ends. It says this, so Moses told the people, again, you must be careful to obey all of the commands of the Lord your God. Follow his instructions in every detail. Stay on the path that the Lord your God has commanded you to follow. Then you will live long and prosperous lives in the land you are about to enter and occupy. So if you want to actually live that in the promise that was promised, if you actually want to live in that promise, how do you do it? You want to follow the commands. And so, of course, the Pharisees, if you're looking at going to Jesus' time, they knew this scripture inside and out. Like, they, they knew the Bible. Like, they knew the Torah, like, very well. More, better than, I think, all of us today would have known the law. They knew it well. So what Jesus was saying here was what they'd already been hearing all the way from Moses, you know, hundreds of years later, the same tradition or the same law was still being practiced. And in fact, it's because of that that I think that a lot of the Pharisees had a lot of problems with Jesus, right? Because Jesus did things differently than they thought things should be done. In fact, there's, there's moments when Jesus heals people and the Pharisees are like, yeah, bro, it's the Sabbath today. Not allowed. Healing is not for the holy day. All the other days, fine, but not the holy day. His, his disciples are picking wheat, and they're like, yeah, ah, ah, not allowed to do that. They're, they're calling him out on the intricacies of it, right? Because they know it. They know it well, and they've been studying, and they've been living it their entire, entire lives. They didn't feel that Jesus and his followers really cared to follow the law well at all. They actually didn't think Jesus and his disciples even cared about the law. They didn't even think maybe they even knew the law. They maybe even thought, like, these guys are heretics. Why? because they didn't even know what the law says. And we've been teaching the law for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. So Jesus is doing things that don't really fit with how we've seen it. And so you know what? We got to figure out a way to trip him up. And we got to figure out a way to, to, to get him out of here because he's starting to build this following. And that's dangerous for us because what he's doing is different than what we think. And this could be a problem. This is this moment that, that, that we see here when they're asking him this question. It always bugged them when Jesus did things and healed people at the wrong time or the wrong moment or the wrong day. But if we, we, I think we all know that this question posed, that Jesus' answer wasn't just love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. That's not how this conversation ends. If you go back to Matthew chapter 22, 
It says this, teacher, which is the most important commandment in the law of Moses? And Jesus replied, right, we're still here. You must love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And second is equally important. Love your neighbor as yourself. The entire law and all of the demands of the prophets are based on these two commandments. The greatest, love the Lord your God. Equally, number two, love your neighbor as yourself. And this would have been the statement that would have been new for them. Because they would have known the law. And really, if you look through the law, especially the Ten Commandments, it's really about taking care of people. Like, don't murder, right? Like, it's like, you know, probably a good thing not to do. Don't be stealing from each other. Honor your mother and father. A lot of that comes out of love your neighbor as yourself. If you don't want someone to kill you, don't go kill somebody, right? Like, it's pretty, pretty simple. But that's how Jesus summarizes this and and I think this is where things kind of got confusing, I think, for some of the Pharisees of like, man, like this is a new concept or this is way more simple than what I've been studying. This is way more simple than the 600 laws that I've been reading about. Love your neighbor. This would have been they, where they would have been a little bit more intrigued in the conversation. Love your neighbor? What does, that, what does that mean to love our neighbor? And we're gonna be going through that next week when we talk about being of four people, but love your neighbor. They ask Jesus the question, who's our neighbor? And then Jesus gives them a story, which we're gonna go through next Sunday. But this is where they really wanted to trick Jesus or catch him. But he says it so beautifully. He says, of course, you have to love your God, Lord God with all your heart, soul, and mind. Of course, you know that. Like, you know what Deuteronomy says. I'm quoting the scriptures to you. But then he also said, we have to love his most precious and beautiful creation, the people he created in his own image and the people he would later head to the cross for. The people he loved so much that Jesus went for. Now, of course, that part of the story hadn't happened yet, but that's the love that Jesus is talking about. And again, we're gonna be going through this next week, the second half of you know, who we are as a church, which is four people. But I wanna spend the rest of our time together today talking about what it means to love our God. What does it mean to love our God? How do we love our God? Well, again, for thousands of years, it's been summed up in three sections since Deuteronomy. We gotta love him with our heart, our soul, and our mind. And even in Mark, I think it's in Mark, it also says strength, where it goes, Deuteronomy says strength. So the wholeness of who we are, our bodies, our minds, our spirits, our souls, our hearts, all of who we are, kind of emotional and spiritual and intellectual and discipline, all these things come together to worship God and love him as we're supposed to. And not exclusively just feeling or not just exclusively emotion or not just exclusively intel intelligence or not just exclusively through discipline, all of it coming together to form spiritually healthy people. I think sometimes we get caught up in the church because we're so focused on feeling or our emotion that we forget to actually study the word and understand it, right? We hear someone say something, we're like, that's the truth. And then we like live that out and we don't even bring it back to scripture. Or we love to have a moment in worship where it's a great experience, but when we go home, there's zero spiritual discipline in our life and our souls are starving for deeper intimacy, we have to be healthy as individuals. If we truly wanna be about Jesus, we have to have all of it working together to serve him. Not just our emotions, not just our intellect and not just our souls or our discipline in it. But you know what this also means? Is that we have to be healthy. We have to be, have healthy minds. We have to have healthy souls. We have to have healthy bodies. We have to have healthy hearts. I think when it comes to loving God and being about him, sometimes being healthy is the hardest thing to do. Having a healthy heart when there's so much abuse or so much trauma or so much in our past that, that keeps hurting us, it's like we feel like we can never get healthy. We feel like every time we take one step forward, it's two steps back. 
And so it's hard for us to get healthy when there's unforgiveness in our life, or it's hard for us to get healthy when we're struggling daily with anxiety and we're struggling daily with depression. It can be hard to be mentally about Jesus when our focus is so much on other things. Being healthy is so important. If we truly want to be about Jesus, we got to get healthy. We got to get healthy in every part of our relationship with Jesus. Sometimes things come more natural to others, and for us, some of us, things don't come naturally at all. You might be the type of person who loves to study the Word. You might have all your concordances and all the things open up, and, and you're reading and you're studying the Word. You know the Word, but there's zero relationship with the Creator. It's all about what you know, but there's no intimacy in it. You have all the information, but that doesn't mean you actually know. I think it's the same in school. I, you know, you have people who know the material. They're very good at regurgitating the information they heard but they don't actually know what it is, right? Like it's like when kids come home and they bring you their new math homework and the new math that makes no sense because we don't know it. You know, I see kids solving math problems. I'm like, man, that seems a little complicated, but that's kind of what is the new math. But just because they know how it works and just because I know that two plus two equals four, I might not know the process how to get there. I know the answer, but I don't actually have this, this, this intimate relationship. We go back to Jesus with him because I know the information, but I don't actually know what is love. I've never experienced the goodness of who he is. I think it all starts with healing. So once we get healthy, which is a, ho- a whole thing I don't have time to get into today, it starts with healing. It starts with forgiveness. But then let's go through. So number one, love the Lord your God with all your heart. All your heart. I think, you know, as men, I think sometimes this is our biggest struggle is loving God with our emotions and with our feeling and with all of it. Because as men, not all the time, but sometimes as men, emotions can be a difficult subject or a difficult thing to know. In fact, when I first started working in my old church, Royal Oak Victory Church, the, uh, my, my, uh, uh, my pastor, so Pastor Dave and his wife, Pastor Clarice, One day she printed out a list of emotions and she gave them to me and said, you should hang this on your desk. Because I didn't know. Like I was, you know, a young kid and I'm learning. I don't know how it all works. And and typically, not again, not always, but typically men struggle with their emotions and typically women often, you know, that's how they feel connected is through emotion. And for men, it's sometimes the opposite. But I think we all have to have a moment where we have this deep, intimate, emotional experience or this emotional connection to God. It can't just, again, be all about what we know or all about our disciplines. we got to know him. we got to be connected to him on an emotional way with all of our hearts. You know, in a study that came out, they said that the term that 15% of men would say they have zero friends. 15% of men. Now, I know, I know that the thought of saying, I don't, I don't need friends. I don't need to have people to connect with. And I, I get that. Because there's moments where I'm like, I... I'm good. But there's also moments where I'm connected with some of my closest friends. And not just in like a, let's go play video games way, but in like a emotional connection way that is so healthy for men. Like extremely healthy for men. You know, I think, I don't know the exact statistics, but the rate of, of men living in isolation and loneliness is skyrocketing. We're seeing mental health in men go down every single year. You know, among young men, suicide is one of the highest rates of death among young men, is men taking their own lives. And this is, this is a, a sad space that we're living in, and I think part of the reason why is I think as men, we have this long craving for emotional connection, but we don't really know how to do it. We want to be connected, Sometimes it's even hard to emotionally connect with our spouses. It can be tough to connect on an emotional level. But it's so important to connection. So how do we connect to God with our emotions? Number one, pour your heart out to him. We don't have to go to God with it all together. We don't go to God when we've already figured it out. As men and women, we go to God when we're (laughs) the first, like, God, I'm not doing so well right now. I need you. 
and poured out your heart to him. What did Jesus do in the garden? That's what he did. He, he poured his heart out to God. And in fact, he was so, in a moment that was emo- emotionally so painful that he was sweating blood. Which is a rare condition that happens when our, when our anxiety or our levels of emotional pain are so high. That's where Jesus found himself in the garden. But I think sometimes we think, I can't pour my heart out to God. Like, I got to be perfect. I got to put on, I got to put on my brave face. I got to put on my strength. And I'm going to go to him when I'm perfect. When the reality is we got to go to him broken. We got to go to him in our most broken space. And sometimes that means weeping. And sometimes that means coming with exuberance or joy. Going to God, not just in our failures, but in our highest victories. In every emotion we have, I know there's moments that we're angry. I had a moment yesterday, I got angry. Why? I was downstairs. And my daughter has this habit of leaving her toys, not in the bin. I'm walking and all of a sudden I stepped on something and I was like, I've broken my foot. It was, I'm exaggerating. I was mad, I'll be honest. It wasn't good. I'm not saying this is a good thing. I was so mad. I started putting the toys away in the bin, gently. <laughs> Y'all know what I'm talking about though. <laughs> I come upstairs best like, so what happened? <laughs> Clearly it was louder than I, than I anticipated, right? I come upstairs and like, Jane, y'all got to put your toys away when you use them. You know, we all have all these emotions. We got to go to him and pour it out to him. You know who created emotion? Not you. If anyone knows anger, look at God. If anyone knows joy, if anyone knows sadness, if anyone knows it, God knows it. Jesus knows it. Yeah, we're so ashamed and we're so scared to go to him with our emotions that it's hard to be about Jesus when we're keeping our emotions away from him. I don't want God to see me mad. He's already seen you mad before. I don't want him to see me weeping. We've got to partner with the Holy Spirit as well. Romans 8, 26. And the Holy Spirit helps us in what? Our weakness. For example, we don't know what, the, what God wants us to pray for, but the Holy Spirit prays of, uh, for us with groanings that not, cannot be expressed in words. The one who knows our emotional turmoil, the one who knows our emotional joy and our emotional sadness, our anxiety, he, he knows it. We gotta partner with him. He helps us in our weakness. Sometimes in life, we're so emotionally distraught that we don't know what to pray for. We don't even know how to pray. I've had moments like that. I'm sure you have too. Like, God, I don't even know what to say. I've gone to God. I'm like, God, I'm gonna pray and and nothing will come out. Just mostly all of, most of my my water comes out of my eyes, you know? I gotta go have a cup of water after some prayer sessions, right? Get rehydrated. (laughs) He helps us in our weakness. The Holy Spirit prays for us. Or we can even pray in the spirit or, or in tongues or when we don't know what to pray. I think sometimes we shy away from prayer because we're like, I don't know what to say. Sometimes it's like, God, you see this mess. I heard a pastor say, he takes your mess and turns it into your message. I heard someone say that? That's our prayer. It's like, God, take this mess, turn it into my message, okay? I'm gonna go, I'm gonna come back. Y'all figure it out. Tell me the plan. I just want the message. I don't want the work. I I don't really want the pain. It's like, nah, just give me the message. The message is the good part, right? That's the testimony, the joy. We can connect emotionally with God when we partner with the Spirit or when we experience His goodness. And in Psalm 34, 8, it says this, taste and see that the Lord is good. Oh, the joys of those who take refuge in Him. Taste and see. You've got to experience his goodness. Taste and see that the Lord is good. And I think there's this common thought in the world right now of how evil God is. I think there's this big focus right now on the, on the 
on how God is evil, which is because we've never experienced his goodness. People have never experienced the joy of the miracle and you're praying for something for year after year or moment after moment or day after day and you're not seeing the answer and all of a sudden you see the breakthrough when the miracle comes and we taste and see that the Lord is good. And when we're dealing with some of the things in our past and we see Jesus and we experience Jesus' love and restoration and grace and joy and that the shame is gone and joy comes and peace comes and the chaos calms and the storm calms and we experience his peace. There's nothing like it. We have to experience his goodness. Not just know about it, but to experience his goodness. Connecting emotionally. That joy will come. And then number two is with all our soul. I think in a lot of ways, this one kind of, not debated, but like kind of, I think in some ways difficult to understand. What does it mean to love the Lord our God with all of our soul? Now how I think of it is that our souls are hungry and thirsty for God. And what do we do? We got to feed it. We got we to gotta feed our spirits. We got to feed our souls. We got to be disciplined enough to live a life that is dedicated to Jesus, disciplined to make time in our busy schedules, to spend time making sure that our souls are healthy. How do we love God with all of our soul? I think it's by disciplining ourselves in some of the practices of, of, of spiritual discipline. See, our, soul, our souls are longing for connection. Longing for restoration. And Ecclesiastes 3.11 says this, Yet God made everything beautiful for its own time. He has planted eternity in the human heart. But even so, people cannot see the whole scope of God's work from beginning to end. Now this part in here, it says, He has planted eternity in the human heart. We have eternity, we have purpose, we have things planted inside of us that God gave us. That our souls are longing for purpose, are longing for truth, are longing for connection, are longing for, to be loved, are longing, and our job is to steward it and grow it. That it's planted, but we gotta water it and we gotta feed it, we gotta, we gotta feed our souls. So what are some of the spiritual practices we should be disciplining ourselves to do? Now, this is just a small amount. There's so many, but these are just some of them. One would be worship. Spending time worshiping Jesus. Spending time, even maybe it's on your drive to work, with some worship music playing. Rather than Justice Beaver, you throw on Elevation Worship. Justice Bieber, it's a joke. Justin Bieber, anyway, it's just like, it's a joke. Everyone's like, I don't know Justice Bieber. Is that a new pop artist? You know, it's like, it's like, is he playing the Super Bowl next year? Like, I don't know. But worship. I think sometimes the only time we worship our God, when? Sunday morning. We spend 30 minutes a week worshiping God, and we're like, yeah, that's my fill. It's like, you only, you only got three drops of water. I think the, the Sunday is a corporate experience of worship, but we got to have intimate, private experiences with worship as well towards God. There's something beautiful about being in someone's home and it's just worshiping together during a small group or whatever it is. Worship. Number two is prayer. I think sometimes the only time we pray is when we're like, oh, shoot, I forgot to pray for my food. God, thanks for my food. Bless it to my body. Bless those hands in Jesus' name. Amen. And we keep on eating. Sometimes that's the only time we pray. The only time we pray is when it's like, we have to. Like, it's like, I got a need, I better pray for it. Prayer is not just about bringing our list to Jesus or bringing our list to God. Prayer is about connecting and listening as well. Worship and prayer, and then also scripture reading and memorization of scripture. Now again, they used to memorize the Torah, and they still do. That doesn't take a week. It takes a week to read it, right? <laughs> they memorized it. I think we've lost this art of memorizing scripture. Why? Because it's so easy just to pull it up on our phone. It's like, what was that verse again? And you Google it and you're like, oh, maybe it's not even in the Bible, you know. 
We gotta memorize scripture. Not just read it, but memorize it. So why? So that when life comes at you and you've ran out of data, you still have access to the scripture. When your Wi-Fi runs out, you're like, oh, I can't read the Bible now. What if it was in your mind? What if you had it memorized and, and you had it with you? Oh, another one is generosity. Spiritual practice of giving. That's a practice that is so tough, but so key to growing closer to Jesus and actually loving him well is by being generous. Another one is service. Serving each other. Serving it, serving the people of our world. We ought to be serving. Another one would be evangelism. When was the last time we had a conversation with someone who didn't know Jesus and we told them a little bit about Jesus or shared some of our story? Or, I think some of us, it's been years. That no one would even know we are followers of Jesus. They won't even know that, that, that we go to church. They won't even know that we, we love Jesus. They might not even know it. Evangelism is key. Another one would be submission and obedience. Submission in the sense of there's some things maybe in our lives that we know we shouldn't be doing, but we're like, ah, it's just, it's, it's, it's fine. It's just a little bit, right? But submitting our lives and surrendering all of us, our heart, soul, and mind to him in obedience. I think if we want to love God with all of our soul, we need to commit to disciplining ourselves and growing in spiritual practices. I think we have to. And I know it's not easy, right? It's not easy when, when life is too busy and you got kids and you're tired and you got to cook the meal and you got to get them to practice and you got to get them to this and you got to go to work. It's not easy to create space. But I think the truth of it is, is that some of us, we value sleep more than we value intimacy with God. Now, I'm not saying it's easy to get up early in the morning because for me, it's not. And Beth can attest to this because... There's some days where, where my alarm's ringing several times with the, the old snooze button. It's not easy sometimes to get out of bed early. Even some of us, we might get out of bed to go to the gym. It's like, that's important. Be healthy physically. But we can't, we also have to be healthy spiritually. We've gotta make sure our souls are taken care of. And then the last one here is the all of our mind. Kind of the last one here. We have to love God with our minds, which I find is such an interesting concept, our mind. We worship him, we love him with our in intellect, with our minds, with our creativity. And part of this is what this means is that we don't just take everything we hear on a Sunday morning and say this is in the Bible. That doesn't mean that this also means when you may be watching a video on YouTube or a sermon on YouTube, it means some, we got to take everything we're hearing and bring it to Scripture. Everything. There's going to be times, I'll be honest, and I, I'm, it's, it's not the best, but there's going to be times where I'm going to say things that are my opinions. There's going to be times where I'm going to say things, and you might go to Scripture and be like, whoa, I'm not seeing that in here. And it's so important for us to understand and realize that. That just because these pastors and just because we, you know, I'm a pastor doesn't mean that everything is, that's being said all the time is, is actually found in the Bible. I'm gonna be honest. Now, of course, I do my best to preach the truth, okay? Like, I want you to know I'm not out here just being like, I'm just gonna tell you wrong things all the time. You figure it out, right? I'm not saying that. But what I am saying is we gotta take everything we hear and bring it to the Bible. The truth, the scripture. Because sometimes we preach from experience. Or sometimes we, we, we share kind of the, what we've done or what we've seen. I'm just going to invite Mike up to play here. We have to learn to study and we have to learn to learn more. We have to study and learn and learn to take everything we hear back to Scripture. We also let, have to let our minds be renewed. And I think this is so key, especially kind of the healing part, Romans 12 too. Don't copy the behavior and customs of this world. But let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. By renewing your mind. 
Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. There's this big idea right now, especially in the younger generations of beloved purpose. Everyone loves purpose, though. We want to be a part of something that has purpose. But we've always wanted to know, what's my purpose in life, right? What is it? Well, this verse tells us, then you will learn to know God's will for you, your purpose for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. How do we do that? Letting our minds be renewed. Changing the way that we think. We don't copy the behaviors and patterns of the world. We don't take our advice for our spiritual walk from the world. We take it from Scripture. Take it from the Bible as we read it. And we let it change the way we think. And I've seen this so many times in my life, which what I thought one thing, and then as I read through Scripture, I'm finding even the way I'm thinking about people or about ideas or about Jesus is, is changing. Some of the concepts or some of the thoughts I had towards certain people, I look at them now and I'm like, I don't even see you in the same way. I, I just see you and I, I love you. That's how we find out our purpose. That's how we find out our will. How? Letting our minds be renewed. Do you know what? Sometimes it's painful letting your mind be renewed. It's like going in for brain surgery. Because sometimes the concepts or the ideas or the way we think about people when there's so much pain, it's like, God, I can't forgive them. No way. It's too painful. And that unforgiveness is holding us back. Holding us back, I think, from the good and pleasing and perfect will that God has for us because God's will for you is not to live in unforgiveness. In fact, the Bible teaches us moment after moment after moment how important forgiveness is. We are about Jesus. Which means we're dedicated to growing closer to him and we love him with all that we are. Not just our emotion, not just our our hearts, not just our souls, not just in our discipline, not just in our minds, but all of it. We got to dedicate ourselves emotionally to him, to discipline ourselves in spiritual practices to feed our souls because our, our souls are hungry for more of him. We got to learn to love, to learn more about him and and develop our minds and understand who he is not just experience it but know why and know how he's this way and what he did to be able to open it up to love you this way you got to know it we are about jesus and our takeaway today is this being about jesus means loving him with all our heart all our soul and all our mind We want to be about him. That's how. In every part of our life, we're dedicated to him. If we want to be about Jesus, that means we're about him in our minds and in our hearts. It means we're about him at work and we're about him at church and we're about him in our car and we're about him at the kitchen table. We're about him at the business, at the business table. We're about him on the airplane. We're about him wherever we go. That when people see us, they see how we think. They see how we act. They see how we love. They say, what's different about you? We say, the only thing different about me is that I'm about Jesus and I'm not all that much about myself. I'm all about him. I've dedicated all that I am to him. That's, that's what makes me so joyful in the midst of chaos. It's not because I'm tough. It's because I'm connected to the Father. When life's falling apart, how can we be so peaceful? Because I'm connected. I'm about Jesus. I may lose it all, but I'll never lose him. That's what keeps us going. And we're about Jesus. We love God with all that we are. All that we are. Not just some. We're not always just seeking the experience. Sometimes we're seeking the understanding. Got to worship him in spirit and in truth. Not just in spirit. 
but also in truth. All our heart, all our emotion, all our soul, all our discipline, all our mind, all of us is how we be about Jesus holistically. All of who we are as a sacrifice, as an act of surrender to him. And we say, God, let your will be done. And then what does he say? Well, I'm gonna give you your will, which is good and pleasing and perfect. Not building it on our own, but building it with him. So God, we thank you. We thank you. And God, today we dedicate all of who we are to you. We give you all of our mind, all of our heart, all of our soul, all of our strength. We give to you today. Help us be about you and all that we do. The strength rises and faith rises up as you pour out our heart to you as we discipline ourselves, as we grow, we give it all to you today. 